it's the fairy man. Oh. Uh, maybe it's real. Huh. <laughs> Scooby-Doo, where are you? Oh, there you are. Do I really need to introduce to you guys what Scooby-Doo is? The gang of beatniks have been travelling in their mystery machine, catching bad guys in masks for over 54 years now, never being out of production long in that time. This silly little series, acting as a very light-hearted gateway into the worlds of gothic and detective fiction for generations of people. As a franchise, it's experienced the highest of the highs, and the uh, lowest of the lows. Couldn't have a show without ya. There's also this website I found while researching. It's an entire Wikipedia dedicated to that one potion scene from Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed. I just wanted to mention that this exists. But let me tell you, the heights don't get much higher than the original love letters to the classic series, an underrated part of the franchise history that we'll be looking at today to see if they still hold up, and they are the original direct VHS trilogy of films. Zombie Island, Witch's Ghost, an alien invasion. And also Scooby Doo and a Cyber Chase. At the time of the first film, the Scooby Doo franchise was about 30 years in and was definitely in a lull production wise. The last truly successful project they had made is the fondly remembered A Pup Called Scooby Doo, a fun reworking of the show for younger audiences. That show had ended back in 1991, leaving an unprecedented seven years without a proper revival. Despite this, and much to Warner Brothers' surprise, the series wasn't experiencing much of a degradation in popularity. Its differing versions were on all the time on channels like Cartoon Network, thanks to a solid viewership. And the 80s films were a staple of Halloween broadcasting. I remember watching Reluctant Werewolf and Ghoul School every year. Don't Google! That last film, the, uh, the internet also remembers it. Taking notice and performing a Q score test, a film was commissioned to both capitalise on the continued love of the series, while also having a little, a little taste of what returning to the IP would be like financially. But rather than going with another TV movie, it was the success of Batman Mask of the Phantasm, surprisingly, that made them up the budget and go with a director VHS release. The success of those home video Batman films are, like Scooby-Doo's, still alive today in yearly installments. They're uh, rarely good, but it's still neat they exist. This, this, this is not okay. This needs to stop now. The writing team was made up of Scooby-Doo alums, with the main trio of Stenstrom, Doi and Leopold being the masterminds behind the trilogy. The direction the team wanted to go with was a darker, though not excessively so, take on the original series. The idea being that time has passed for these characters the same as it has for us watchers, and we were reuniting for a more mature, but still quintessentially Scooby-Doo story. For animation duties, the job was handed over to Mook, a Japanese studio that at the time carved out a niche making surprisingly well animated western shows like Spawn, Men in Black, and X-Men Evolution. We got a number one victory royale, yeah, Fortnite we bout to get down. get down. Ten kills on the board right now, just wipe out tomato. Hey yo, look at them go! With all the pieces in place, and indifferent producers letting them do just whatever, the franchise was ready to rise from the dead with its first entry. Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. So come along with Scooby and all the gang in their most frightening mystery ever. Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. Because this time, the monsters are real. So one of my favourite parts of this film is that we begin by picking up with the gang a few years separated from the original series. Yeah, I really miss them. Yeah, like we really miss you too, Daphne. <laughs> They've naturally gone their independent ways, with Velma running a small bookshop, Shaggy and Scooby slumming it as airport security, this bit is cute, and Daphne working as a small-time reporter with Fred as a cameraman. There's something really nice about how they're all on good terms, and the writers didn't go too crazy with their futures. Velma's not inventing spaceships, and Shaggy isn't a world-class chef. They're all leading normal lives. 
Speaking of which, Fred decides to surprise a burned out Daphne with a reunion, deciding to do a nostalgic road trip together to reconnect and film for a new show. So, what's coming up for the new season? A new series of segments called Haunted America. Sort of a ghost to ghost with Daphne Blake. Boo! You stink! If this setup sounds familiar, well it's because writer James Gunn lifted it for the 2002 live-action film. Only much more cynically. In fact, it's Zombie Island's positive character dynamics that really sell this film. They do such a good job at communicating to us the history these guys have together. Which is particularly impressive considering only Fred's voice actor Frank Welker returns from the original shows. Real talk, until Velma, this man had always played Fred voicing him since the original 1969 series. Mm, mm. This place is locked up tighter than a drum. I bet whoever that is is the one who's really behind this. That's crazy, I, I love it. BJ Ward is also here as Velma, reprising the role after first appearing in the best crossover ever made. <laughs> My glasses. I can't be seen without my glasses. All right, Scooby Natural comes close. We are still largely attempting to do something fresh with the IP here, but we first get a nice throwback montage of the gang dealing with familiar situations. Establishing the status quo, paying homage to it, before they break it later. It has a sincere love of its past, even when subverting it, opposed to simply pointing out a trope and saying it's stupid. Speaking of which, if there's a main character in this film, it's surprisingly Daphne. For initially being the most undeveloped character in the gang, events in this narrative revolve around her feelings of monotony. Bad guys in masks, mechanical claws, magnets, hologram projectors. Just like the good old days. Too much like the good old days. Despite being the biggest success of the team, she's also the most dissatisfied with how her life's turned out. The stories she covers are repetitive and boring, and though never really resolved in this film or, like, ever, she's outwardly irritated towards Fred's stagnant approach to starting a relationship. So while this montage is fun nostalgia bait for us viewers, for Daphne it's just not what she's looking for. Still, not wanting to give up, the gang decide to follow a tip from a woman claiming that her island is haunted by the ghost of an old pirate guarding his lost treasure. And <laughs> already this is sounding like a broken record. By this point, the gang has caught up with us viewers. Dramatic irony has just become ironic. They're self-aware of the Scooby-Doo formula. Things might not be as they seem, however. Although the gang can't, we are able to feel a difference in this case once they arrive. For starters, the plantation they visit is not cartoonally gothic. It's not a big Dracula-esque castle or an abandoned theme park run by one of their many uncles. It's quiet and it's eerie. The fact it's a plantation alone carries significant unpleasant weight that's not normally present in the locales they investigate. And on top of that, the surroundings and music convey an environment that's distant and unwelcoming. If there's something all three films excel at, it's the atmosphere. They lean harder into the series being a horror-themed show, and while that doesn't mean there's gore and jump scares, more time is invested in building a spooky atmosphere. They also modernised some other aspects of the series, such as Daphne's ghost hunting show as both narrative drive and character motivation. They're not just doing this because, um, you know what, <laughs> they never gave a reason in the original, how were they making money? This TV show conceit also adds this analogue motif of seeing the supernatural occurrences through the lens of VHS footage, a whole year before Blair Witch did it. <laughs> Was that a stretch? I just wanted an excuse to show the Blair Witch parody they did later on. My feet hurt! Well, is it our fault you wore high heels on a hiking trip? At least I try to look feminine! I particularly love that they update old running gags and add nods to the original opening. They even homage the semi-frequent musical numbers of the original series, obviously swapping the late 60s pop music with more contemporary tracks from bands like Third Eye Blind and Sky Cycle. <laughs> I'm, I'm being facetious, uh, Terror Time is an unquestionable bop. It's 
not all perfect though. This was the first time they decided to nix Fred's ass card for being too dated. An error that lasted just, just way too long. Put that back on right now! Jokes aside though, there are one too many Shaggy and Scooby eating scenes for the length of the film. And while the gothic horror elements are definitely being exemplified, the detective work has taken a big backseat. Both problems are addressed in the next two films at least. I think my favourite throwback of all though is the return of the old Scooby Snacks gag. Since they're no longer made, uh, Velma surprises the lads with a box she'd been saving for years, only for them to have uh, gone stale. There's something a little sad about that actually, the physical representation of how much time has passed. It can also be seen as a bit of a commentary on the franchise. The old formula was stale, and it was time for something new. So, after an extended stay on the island, wherein they experience a few unexplainable phenomena, they peg the gardener as the main suspect. A man who Velma has to balance being attracted to, and suspicious of. Try making that spin off now, bitch! Something else Gunn would lift for the live action film. Twice! Three times! In fact, let's just burn through these right now. We've got Velma's suspicious love interest, the gang disbands for a few years, they reunite for an investigation on an island, they are in denial of the real supernatural events, Daphne knows Kung Fu now, Shaggy and Scooby have a hot pepper competition, Voodoo! Villain's plan involves stealing souls to live forever. Oh, I see you over there, Gun. Show you're working out! All of this builds to the money shot of Zombie Island. Still convinced they're dealing with a man in a mask, Fred approaches a zombie that's appeared and... <laughs> Status quo, destroyed. Now, they had played around with the idea of introducing real monsters into Scooby-Doo a lot before, but this is the first time they had set up what the show had been and how characters from that show would deal with facing the real thing. And they do it in the gnarliest way they were allowed to. I mean, look at this imagery. I love it for a number of reasons. In fact, let me go off road for a second here. In children's writing theory, there's a strict adherence to the monomyth narrative structure. Stories will be told in three distinct phases. Departure, initiation, and return. That last stage is seen as particularly important in that medium, representing the regaining of safety and normalcy after enjoying independence and danger. Change is presented as temporary, for now at least, and the adventure as controlled and separate from everyday life. It's all part of building children's confidence without breaking their bubble, so to speak. Wendy will always come back from Neverland. Alice always wakes up, Harry Potter gets on the train, Dorothy's back in Kansas, Alex Ryder rejoins Jack, the kids come out of the wardrobe, and so on and so on. For Scooby-Doo, the return was represented in debunking the supernatural. It's a man in the mask, it all makes sense again. Ah, <sighs> normal. So it's not just the fact we have death and monsters that makes this film a more mature, fleshed out YA experience, but the fact that it allows the cast and the viewers to remain in that status quo shift by the end. Maybe even ironically, as you'll see as we progress. Now, alone, this is a concept you can make a film around. It was certainly the main selling point in all of the trailers. The true genius of this first film is that it's not just Scooby-Doo meets real zombies. When we think we figured out the conceit of this film, we're hit with the real twist. Earlier on, we're told the island's tragic history. A pirate gang had landed on the shores of this once peaceful village, looking for a place to store their pirate gold, the red herring of the film. They then, uh, they feed the villagers to alligators. Holy shit! In an actual shocking revelation, we see that the hosts of the island, Simone and Lena, were there. We uttered a curse on the pirates to destroy them as they had destroyed our island. Our wish was granted. And had prayed to their pagan god for revenge, gaining the power to kill the pirates, but cursed to live forever as cat people. Over the years, boats continued to come to our island. The plantation flourished. At least until the harvest moon. The two reveal they had lured the gang there as they need to feed on souls once every harvest moon. Fun fact, the use of cat people as monsters comes as a reference to SWAT Cats, that old 90s cartoon. This was a rough idea that was originally planned for that show by the writers and they kept the aspect on. 
The zombies we saw were never there to harm them. Just previous victims trying to help and rewatching with that knowledge, you can see that clearly. It's also when you get a sense of the sheer number of times these two have performed the ritual, with the time period of the zombies' clothes varying wildly. I mean, real talk, the body count of this film is fucking high. <laughs> and I appreciate how mature and moral this is for younger audiences. That experience in trauma doesn't give you permission to turn into a monster yourself. That victims can redirect the pain inflicted on them towards the wrong direction. In fact, it kind of reminds me of how when a show will try and give a villain a developed backstory, only for Twitter to throw hands and harass the writers like they're saying, oh, this bad guy's actually good. Uh, I digress. Managing to undo the spell at the last moment, we get treated to a villain death scene that'd make even classic Disney blush. Do that. The sun rises and the gang leaves, a little shaken from their adventure and Daphne a little wiser in a be careful what you wish for kind of way, though still acquiring her hot scoop. The film ends on a nice note, the island is allowed to rest after years of tragedy unsettled it. Overall, Zombie Island is a very impressive project considering the circumstances. As mentioned, it's not perfect, they really could have done something more with the fisherman than what they did which was nothing, but it's damn impressive. A very solid project. I showed this film to my fiance, who has literally never seen anything Scooby-Doo related before. Stop it, stop it, please, I beg you! Not only did she really dig it, she was surprised at how likeable the gang was, kind of convinced by cultural references that they were just boring side characters to the dog. And others agreed. The film did really well, surprisingly well. Not only was this a really good animated film, but it was the first new Scooby-Doo material in seven years and people noticed. It helps that the film also received the largest promotional push WB had ever done for an animated film at an estimated 50 million or 88 million in today's buckaroos. Why they didn't just put it in cinemas, I, I don't know. You will see that uh, the studio seemed to be in serious denial that people still liked this dumb dog and his group of freaks. Not to spoil the rest of the video, but I do consider Zombie Island to be the best of the trilogy. One of the best films based on an animated kids show ever. It's a great Halloween watch on a cozy night and it warms my little peanut brain to see something that both holds such clear reverence for the childhood favorite while also successfully elevating it into something new. I mean, real talk, it's crazy to me that Cyber Chase has gone on a Blu-ray release, but Zombie Island hasn't. It doesn't make sense. Also, the uh, DVD is the only one in the collection I bought with no cover. I mean, what's that about? The fuck is this? <clears throat> anyway, with Zombie Island a resounding success, a sequel was a no-brainer. Only on video. Mysteries as old as mankind. Witchcraft. Hi. Talking dogs. Run? Where? It's the all new fully animated movie Scooby Doo and the Witch's Ghost. Ghost hunting is our specialty. I'm a hex boy and I'm going to put a spell on you. Scooby-Doo and the Heck Girls, the second in our trilogy, made and released a year after the last. Even though I consider Witch's Ghost to be not that far behind Zombie Island in terms of quality, its production was significantly rockier. The first film was seen as a one-off experiment, something WB commissioned almost on a whim. As such, the creative team had a lot of autonomy that shines through in the final project. Witch's Ghost, however, is a follow-up to a big success. More eyes were on the team, more cooks squeezing their way into the writer's room, more people trying to get an easy credit that looks good. There was a lot of tension because of this. Not only did the Zombie Island team feel insulted that making such a hit was rewarding them with less control, there was also unsurprisingly a lot of tug of war regarding the use of scary material. You know, despite the more mature tone being one of the first film's biggest source of praise. The tension was so bad that Leopold left the franchise after its release. Still, let's get into it and see how they did. I refuse to acknowledge the absolutely dire cover of the theme by Billy Ray Cyrus. We're skipping it. So, immediately we sadly start to see the old formula begin to peek its head back into the franchise. 
It's still the same older gang from before, but the ghost hunting show angle has just been dropped completely, which sucks because I loved it. There's also no longer a wrap around the plot, that element of them being reunited. They're just back to traveling around at random. Maybe you should try getting a job. Good road trip vibes this time at least. The gang arrive in a small town called Oakhaven, just in time for their autumn festival. We're very much taking what works from the backdrop of the last film and sticking with it, because once again we have this quaint, isolated setting with a history that gives it a dark undercurrent. This case being the burning of accused witches. Though we can already feel the writers being held back a bit, as we're only told about it rather than shown. Ben's ancestor who was persecuted as a witch way back in 1657. Unjustly persecuted. Sarah Ravencroft was a medicine woman who practiced natural healing and was unfairly accused because of her eccentric ways. Just like the Salem witch trials. The gang are here after being invited by Ben Ravencroft, a famous horror author. Think Stephen King but without the child p They're mostly going- <laughs> They're mostly going because Velma is a huge sim for Tim Curry but, you know, who isn't? Scooby Doo. The film branches off the previous eerie southern Louisiana vibe with a spooky New England feel, perfect for the theme of witches and ghosts. Very Sleepy Hollow-esque. Real talk, all these films are so goddamn cozy. Not knocking digital animation, of course, some amazing things are being done with it nowadays, but I just don't think they'll ever quite recapture that feel traditional animation had. I would love to grab a coffee and read in Velma's bookshop or eat gumbo in the gang's van in Louisiana. Not long after being in Oakhaven do they hear that the town's being haunted by the ghost of Ben's ancestor, a woman burnt alive by the town for being a witch. Though, instead of being scared and leaving as they usually would in the original show, the townspeople are cashing in hard. Deciding to take on the case despite the mayor's protests, we actually see a nice increase in detective work. Ah, young love. Lucky for you, I'm a dog lover. I appreciate that we get more clues than we did in Zombie Island, and we spend a lot more time on the investigative legwork. For instance, they all go their separate ways and follow different leads and suspects to figure out what's been going on. This mayor's one busy guy. Ugh. It's here that they meet the Hex Girls, a goth band who pretend to be vampire witches for their stage personas. Like, hi girls. <laughs> Make it dirty. I don't see it said anywhere, but I always thought of them as a throwback to when Hanna-Barbera would throw bands into a lot of their cartoons. They did it so many times. Now if you know anything about this film, you know about this band. I don't think they were talked about much when the film first released, but they had a boom in popularity on the internet years later. Mostly due to thirsty dudes, but also from people who genuinely liked the designs and their songs. It would even appear in an episode of Mystery Inc., the only other appearance to this date. The Hex Girls have appeared many times throughout the years. For this film, they're here to be red herrings, to provide the soundtrack diegetically, to eventually be the deus ex machina to fix everything, and to even add to the romantic tension between Fred and Daphne left over from the last film. Thorn seems like the leader. Let's follow her. Are you sure you're not just stuck on Thorn, Freddy? Bitch, are you for real? As characters, they're the Swiss army knife of plot devices. Speaking of red herrings, it's not long before it's revealed that the gang were actually right. Unlike last time, there isn't any ghost. The whole thing was a hoax set up by the town to increase revenue for the festival, capitalising on both Ben's fame and the legend of his murdered ancestor. Fucking assholes. When I talked about too many people trying to have a hand in this project, this was one of the larger points of contention. I get the vibe the new people WB forced in didn't even watch the first film because they wanted the story to end here, reasoning, uh, Scooby Doo? You can't not have it be fake, besides it's less scary this way. These writers were not without power, so the plot points stuck. Still, 
The OGs wisely understood how anticlimactic that would be, and circumvented the plan by rewriting the script to add on a third act taking place after this revelation. Saving the entire picture in my opinion. The whole film, Ben Ravencroft has been whining about finding his ancestor's book to clear her name. She even kept a journal of all the patients she cured with her herbal remedy. Handmade nails, horseshoes, farm equipment. How about a book? But never found anything. That book could finally prove Sarah's innocence. You know how long I've been searching for Sarah's journal. That's all we found. <laughs> no bones. No book. Ugh, I gotta find her book. Shut up. In a nice example of that increased focus on detective work, was shown that a book found earlier was in fact the book's seal, pointing them where to dig it up. You probably didn't piece that together, but the fact you could have is what's important. So, like Zombie Island, it's time for the big twist. Unsurprisingly, the character voiced by Tim Curry turns out to be the nasty bad man. It's a spell book. You don't hire this voice and not make it say crazy shit. And since Sarah's blood runs in my veins, I guess that makes me a warlock. I could also go off theorizing what's canon in Scooby-Doo, considering the reuse of the 13 Ghosts chest design for the book, but I'll spare you. It's just a nice little reference. When Ben turns bad, it's like the cuffs are off for the animators. They really go ham. I like a lot of the first two thirds. What it lacks in bombast and scares, it makes up for with charming character interactions and a genuine air of mystery. It is this last act though, the one that the team went over production's head to make, where it really feels like a film-worthy plot. There might be something to be said about how the commentary on the mistreatment of Wiccans is kind of erased when it's revealed that the victim actually was an evil witch. Had the film actually ended with the villagers just exploiting the memory of a dead, innocent woman for profit, yeah, the core message probably would have been stronger. But I can't hate that this is here. Kind of being antithetical to the film's moral probably came from it being a sneaky addition after the fact, but it's just so much fun. It does go on a bit too long and is significantly more comical than the last film. Especially this big turkey, I, I didn't get a lot of laughs out of him. But it adds a much needed climax to the film. Ravencroft may not be as memorable as the zombies or the cat people, but goddamn is Tim Curry having so much fun, it's hard not for it to rub off on you. <laughs> this isn't one of your silly little mysteries. You can't solve me so easily. <laughs> In a perfect world, they probably would have merged these two endings into something that was a bit more complementary and coherent. But I think the team did really well, especially considering the behind the scenes troubles. After a nice scene of the gang working together to get the book to Thorn, the witch is sealed back in her prison. Ben is also sucked off and burned and no one seems to care. Ben Ravencroft's last book is one the world will never buy. But like it would have been a hot bestseller. Damn. The film then wraps up pretty quickly with the mayor lamenting that they now need a new attraction. You still have the Hex Girls. Oh, no offense girls, but I think we need a bigger attraction. <gasps> Burn. Cute, cute, goofy goth rock song and we're at the end. You serious? I feel like I might have been a bit more critical this time, but the film is still very much worth a watch. They balanced the stuff they weren't allowed to carry over from Zombie Island as best as they could, making it a tamer but pretty interesting follow-up. It's not got the same depth to it as the last film or even Alien Invasion has, which actually might be why people gravitate towards the pure sex girl so much. The true villains are kind of forgettable, but Despite no numbers existing, the quality must have been reflected in the sales again, as it was yet again successful enough to repeat the formula a third time. Coming this fall, you will notice an eerie greenish glow. Your heart will beat faster. Your palms start to sweat. 
Suddenly, you know they are among us. It's the all-new movie, Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders, coming all 2000. It's just the beginning. Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders. It was the first film to shake up the core team, with Leopold leaving and being replaced by writer Falk, who had acted as a model supervisor in the first two films. Now, speculation on my end, but I feel like the tense situation of Witch's Ghost probably played a role here, which is ironic because the team reports that pressure actually eased up considerably for Alien Invaders. Still, the change is definitely felt. I even get the vibe that Leopold might have been the main one pushing for those scarier, more mature elements, as neutered as they had become in Witch's Ghost. Still, Alien Invaders is not a bad film. After the last two gothic homages, it's cool to see this production team tackle the conspiracy, X-Files-like genre the franchise had never really gone into, but which fits it like a glove. The films are getting lighter and lighter as they go on though, culminating in the next film, Cyber Chase, which drops the effort entirely. Which is funny, because more than the others, Alien Invaders is for some reason advertised like it's a straight up horror. <laughs> Now, if Zombie Island was Daphne's film and Witch's Ghost Velma's film, then Alien Invasion is definitely Shaggy and Scooby's. You don't get a film, Fred! Now already, that sets up the film for some problems. While the faces of the franchise, Scooby and Shaggy are the comic relief. The story is traditionally driven or focused on one of the other three. It's perfectly possible to focus on comic relief in narratives, it's been done before. Especially if the goal is to reveal depth you didn't initially know was there, but it is harder. Look away, Daphne. We all promised each other that we would never speak of him. Not ever. Hurdles of getting invested in them beyond jokes, in them not wearing out the welcome with more screen time, the usual stuff. Monsters Unleashed of all films was surprisingly almost able to pull this off. It kinda. They really shouldn't have cut this scene. You think we're gonna make it, Scoop? No! Me neither. In any case, we start this time in the middle of the Nevada desert. Instead of the usual slow build approach to setting the tone, we start extremely abruptly with the gang suddenly ambushed by a UFO. You can't say they're wasting time. I really enjoy the design of the spaceship. The sci-fi elements in general are not really a style I see often. Echoes of Mook's time with the Men in Black series shining through here. And we still have that cozy element of Americana road trips. Seeing the gang sleep in the van and the use of jackalopes to build on local mythology. I'm also a sucker for old school alien sound design. If you've got a theremin, then I'm on your dick faster than Sonic Deep Throat in the Chili Dog. <laughs> I told you I'd say it. Shaken up and in denial, the gang take refuge in a small desert town. Talking with the locals, they're told tales of aliens that have been harassing the civilians and the local government research station nearby called South, which I'm choosing not to believe is an elf reference. Remember Elf? He's back! In pod form! So around this point you can appreciate how elastic Scooby is this time. They've amped it up for the physical comedy. And I really like this joke. Do you have any proof that you were abducted? Yep. I got pictures. Oh! Paintings. So you really feel how the tone's lighter than ever before. But not jarringly so. It's not as eerie and unwelcoming as the bayou, nor does it have that dark history bubbling up. But it's replaced with the more lonely and wondrous vibe that can be elicited when you're in the desert by yourself at night. It's pretty groovy up here. Oh, oh. Yep, it's nice, ain't it? While resting up, Shaggy and Scooby are actually abducted by aliens and experimented on in a scene that actually does start kinda creepy. But right away, here is one of the major issues. We're 15 minutes in and you've probably already figured out who these aliens are. 
after a long night of having their crystal coves zoinked. Watch me swing right in! <laughs> the pair wake up in the middle of the desert by a travelling hippie photographer and her dog. With the mystery part of the film being very condensed, here's where the real meat of the story actually lies, the budding romance Shaggy and Scooby develop with these two. While it's very typical ground we're covering, it's nice to see Shaggy humanised in this way. As I said, you really need to explore some further sides of a character if you're going to make the walking punchline succeed as a lead. And while we're kind of doing the bare minimum here, it's still sweet to see this almost childlike approach to romance they both have. But for music, after four actual bangers in the first two films, Alien Invaders drops the ball. The first one is Unbearable Cheese Personified. And in an instant I knew everything would be groovy. But with Crystal's design itself being a throwback to the show's original time period, animating this whole fantasy in a style reminiscent of 60s animation was a really nice touch. While the film series is starting to feel like it's running out of steam, it still has a lot of heart put into it from the staff, and it's coming through. The gang reunite and have a quick catch-up. Who sold pancakes? Fred, you absolute psychopath! They share their story, but of course, even though the gang have seen zombies, furries, witches, ghosts, and an actual UFO yesterday, they don't believe them. Besides, they're more interested in the crush these two have developed. I'm a dog lover! As per usual, the gang decide to split up and look for clues, with Fred, Daphne and Velma going over to South, while Shaggy and Scooby go off simping into the desert. Animation-wise, the film is as strong as the others, but I feel they really step up the vistas in the background. Some of these are actually really beautiful, and there wasn't a small chance that the film would look considerably more dull than the last two, being set in the desert and all, but it's the best looking one. And it's actually a shame that the mystery is so obvious, as the film continues Witch's Ghost's focus on detective work. With more viable suspects, this could have been the best mystery of the three. Back in the valley, Crystal reveals that she is the weirdest dressed government agent there's ever been. They are interrupted by two government officials who tell them to leave. I was wondering, um, if you had a boyfriend? As a matter of fact, I don't. <laughs> oh, good. Upon inspecting the area more closely, they find a series of tunnels with a lot of digging equipment. Cue one more chase sequence, uh, although the song this time is super weird. Kinda like a Ninja Turtle made a soft rock song about aliens. A bit of a step down from Sky Cycle and Heck Girls. Speaking of stepping down... So, you figured it out, huh? Wasn't hard. No shit. The aliens are finally revealed to be the members of South this whole time. Turns out they had found gold in these caves, and they were trying to scare people off from finding it. AKA the plot Zombie Island used as misdirection. I would have thought staging a hoax in order to continue their funding would have been more appropriate, but what are you gonna do? They started all of the alien stuff to hide the noise of their digging, which also feels like trying to put out a fire by setting off a volcano. Looking at all three, we've gone from a truly left turn reveal to a surprising third act tonal shift to just... Uh, yeah, I mean, who else would it have been? The fact there are three aliens alone rules out the car mechanic and crystal. The fresh energy we started with is unfortunately just about used up now. However, we're not quite done yet. Like before, we have one last twist, as Shaggy's girlfriend turns out to be... It comes a little too late in the game, though there are some actually subtle hints throughout the film. The twist of the monster being real after the fakes are unmasked is repeated from Witch's Ghost, but the consequences of this are way less impactful. With 10 minutes left, we just get a JCB fight. <laughs> And then it's time for Crystal to say goodbye to Shaggy. I have to go now. My planet needs me. 
Come on, you big drip. Where you going? <sighs> a gelatinous, genderless blob by any other name. Right, Norville? We're definitely checking the supernatural is real box very last minute this time. The last time the animated films will actually ever do that, as Cyber Chase will re-establish the Scooby-Doo loop permanently. Thanks to that help from Mulder's wet dream, the South team are all arrested and sentenced to life in prison with no trial. Wow. Okay. And we're already at the end. The gang drive off to many, many, many more adventures, and the film comes to a close. Alien Invaders has this reputation as being the first bad one. I don't think it's bad by any means though. The atmosphere is still very impressive, the animation is still solid stuff, and the gang's chemistry is as cute as ever. That's a very brave thing to do, Scooby. Thank you. You're welcome. I also appreciate the pure sass Fred has this time. Dig that, Scoob! A talking dog! Real? Imagine that. She's wonderful. Hmm. <laughs> Nothing personal. You just know too much. Yeah, that's always our problem. So yeah, it's got problems. But despite them, I think I might actually enjoy it a bit more than Witch's Ghost. What it's lacking in subtle gothicism, it's making up for it with more charm. That said, we are ending our journey on a standard, if charming, little adventure. Soinks! It's the gay blade of the ghost, 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 ghost! Alright, okay, you win! Alright, I'll watch it, I'll watch Cyber Chains. Are you happy now? It's the all new movie Scooby Doo and the Cyber Chase. <laughs> Coming to video cassette and DVD October 2001. <coughs> the last of the MOOC films, the last to launch on VHS, the last to be directed by Stenstrom. I originally didn't cover this film because it kind of exists outside of the first three. Across the trilogy, we've seen the old formula slowly creep its way back in, and that innovative, darker tone slowly drain away. Cyber Chase is the culmination of all of this. While it's a project that's still doing some pretty weird things worth talking about, it represents the reset button being hit and hit hard. It's the series going back to normal. And why, you may ask? Well, as mentioned, Witcher's Ghost production was pretty fraught with executive meddling. And while Alien Invaders seemed to offer some hope to the team that this was a one-time issue, Cyber Chase would have more pressure than ever before. For instance, to prevent being circumvented again like in Witcher's Ghost, a contracted writer was forced in by the studio very late into Cyber Chase production. This meant that not only did they have barely any time to animate his changes, there was no time to get creative about it. No surprise third act this time to save the film. I'm totally empathetic for their frustration. These are staple figures in the series. They've had massive success, and now they're having to answer to someone with zero animation experience, having to even argue and fight to veto ideas that were literally impossible to animate. And it really is a shame, as Stenstrom's original pitch for the film sounds like it was pretty surreal and kind of wacky. For instance, in an example of meta comedy, all of the cyberspace sections were originally planned to be live action. I can only imagine how that would have looked. With Leopold already gone, Cyber Chase just pushed things too far. Doi, Stentrum, and Falk all left the franchise too. The brain trust that had revived the franchise and garnered critical praise was now officially dead. Though we don't know anything about it, they had already planned a fifth film that was more in line with the first two, but they were just fully convinced they were not going to be allowed to make it how they wanted. Um, we got Legend of the Vampire instead. I was getting worried. Now I am worried. Great. So why did the studio give them a pass for Alien Invaders and then suddenly come down harder than ever before? It's kind of hard to tell. Studios can be fickle and sometimes even act randomly. One difference I did notice, however, is that Alien Invaders was the last full project to be made while William Hanna was still alive. Cyber Chase itself is dedicated to him. Now, I don't really believe a 90-year-old executive producer actually had that much input in these films. 
but the changing of the guard might have just introduced a more heavy-handed approach to overseeing projects. In fact, in the wake of his death, WB did absorb the studio into itself, and even removed the classic Hanna-Barbera logo at the end of their cartoons. Still, that's just the way it sometimes goes. Let's get into the actual film one last time. Oh, it's the cyber chase, I guess. The other films had big title reveals and exciting set pieces to kick things off, but this time it's just, fuck, yeah, you know, you know what you're watching. More than the others, this doesn't feel like a movie, it feels like an episode of What's New Scooby-Doo. Now, that show was fine, but come on. Any progress, Eric? Sorry, Professor Kaufman. There's still something wrong with the program. Well, we can't do any more experiments with the laser. Are you joking? I'm, I'm sorry, there's just there's just no way to find this guy intimidating. I kind of like the yellow features, they're a nice touch, but he looks like a freakazoid villain. <laughs> Here's the bad guy for the film. The human doodle. Continuing Alien Invaders' brevity, the film once again forgoes any wraparound or setup in favour of just getting right to the point. It's so impressive that Eric received a grant for his computer project. In this case, being the gang visiting an old friend, who's recently gotten in attention for his VR game he made based on their adventures in the original TV show. They're taking this uh, very well, considering he did not ask permission to do this. Now let's uh, address the elephant in the room, the first thing you're probably already noticing the unfortunate decrease in animation quality. You can still see the ghost of the style the trilogy once had, but the colours are more saturated, shading is very basic, backgrounds are simpler to say the least, and characters are moving considerably more rigidly. Now most people chalk this up to it being one of Mook's early digital projects, having first cut their teeth on season one of X-Men Evolution. That certainly explains things like issues with the colours, however the biggest contribution has to be the fact that, thanks to those last minute writing decisions, a significant portion of the animation had to be outsourced to an unknown studio just to meet the deadlines. And you can really tell which ones. I mean, fuck, I, I would've quit too. The voice cast is as strong as ever, at least. Outside of Matthew Lillard as Shaggy, these are still the voices I associate with these characters. Though this is unfortunately the last time we'll be hearing Scott Innes and BJ Ward. We're also missing any guest voices, no Tim Curry's or Mark Hamill's this time, which is a real shame. <laughs> What's the matter, Velma? Don't you like the new, improved Ben Ravencroft? We do have uh, Lupin the Third's voice as this hat man. I just, I just wanted to mention Lupin the Third. Okay, all right, all right. I'm sorry, I won't keep harping on about the animation, but what the hell did they do to Daphne? <laughs> she looks like an inflatable sex doll. Using paper overlays is a nice attempt, but God, I mean, look at this. It looks finger painted. You can feel the artists trying to get their talent to show through the technology. The lab technicians show off their Willy Wonka Tron machine they've invented. They've been using it to zap objects into cyberspace to make game development time go quicker. I mean, I mean, there's just got to be a better use for that. Well, there's no virus in my baseball game, and it's more entertaining. That goes baseball! That's really cool, Bill. And around this scene is when I noticed the sheer frequency of sound effects. I feel like they're trying to counter the reduced frames this time by creating the illusion of movement through sound design. Like you want us to be virus bait? Like, no way, man. Huh? Uh. If it's just a computer virus, God's sake, time blink. Anyway, while in this lab, the gang are sucked into the video game, and the rest of the film revolves around them trying to escape. Oh, 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 here it comes! <laughs> yeah, hell yeah! <laughs> Remember when everything was doing this at the time? God, we were so impressed with the bare minimum of CGI. Oh, innocent times. I want to go back. Throw a switch or something and get him out! The game doesn't work that way. Uh, it did before. So now we're here, you could argue that the whole cyberspace angle is science fantasy and thus continuing the spirit of introducing fantastical elements. But I can't say it's doing much for me. Feels less like an evolution and exploration of the genre as the first three did. 
and just more doing a gimmick. It also has that distinct early 2000s problem of trying to represent video games but never actually feeling like them. Not unlike those old Fox Kids video game bumpers if anyone else remembers those. As a kid, I really wanted to play this. In fact, it almost feels like they originally planned to do a time travel film, but for whatever reason had to pare it back. In any case, the gang has to beat each level in order to leave. Standard stuff for this kind of setup. Scooby-Doo inventing the Isekai genre 20 years ago. Thanks for that. Oh, but there's a hitch. While beating the game, they're being chased by the Phantom Virus. Oh, oh. Oh. On more than one occasion, you can unfortunately make out the background peeking out from under the upper cells. This is an issue caused when the layers are misaligned with the aspect ratio. I gotta imagine that these are due to those rushed outsourced shots. Same for those backgrounds too. I noted the finger painted tier ones early, but some others are perfectly fine. It's jarring. We'll go from this genuinely nice Egyptian background to actual stretched and compressed JPEG tier backgrounds. Uh, it might be a little early for a celebration, gang. <laughs> oh my god. So this is the loop for the rest of the film. With the whole setting being this lab, we're forgoing the Americana road trip vibes for the first time. And with the bright colours and the cyberspace levels, there's not any gothicism either. Even the big throwback in the third act is an operating theme park rather than a spooky abandoned one, which just feels like a big oversight. With all of that in mind, how's the mystery element then? The last of the core pillars. The ghost likes baseball, so it's the guy who likes baseball. Let's play ball! How's this for a heavy hit? You're in the major leagues now. Let me introduce you to the home team. Let's play ball. Yeah, we're, we're pulling a Sherlock, there's not really any mystery this time. Detective work is suddenly gone after a nice building up of it in the last three films. In fact, the whole film is essentially one long chase scene, so there's also a lot less interaction between the gang. In general, this one really feels skewed to a much younger audience than before. Get back, you creepy thingy! Creepy thingy? <laughs> Like, not just younger than the relatively mature Zombie Island, younger than even the original show. You really feel that new writer. So much of the gang's back and forth is dedicated solely to exposition, which just wasn't an issue before. The wax is hardening. He can't move. So, while running through the levels, we somehow get a song that's the most aggressively 2000s one yet. <laughs> I mean, I mean, right, have you, have you seen him? Not to be overly negative though, the last third of the film does focus on an admittedly neat idea. That being the gang meeting older versions of themselves and real versions of their past monsters. You get out of here, gun! I'll give him a pass for this one. They legit did it way better in Monsters Unleashed. The idea in Cyber Chase is great, but the choices are really odd. I mean, they've got Creeper, which is good. He's kind of the quintessential Scooby-Doo villain. And I've always thought Monsters Unleashed made some kind of mix-up and chose Zombie by accident. But then we have Gator Ghoul, Old Iron Face, Jaguaro. I mean, where's Captain Cutler? Where's the 10,000 Volt Ghost? And how did both of these films do my boy Space Cook so dirty? Still, gotta give them props with coming up with the idea. I, I do love it, it's just another film was able to do it better and with a nice large selection of them. It's like every villain we've ever faced is here. It's like five of our villains are here. It's a lot harder for the audience to get invested in the gang meeting their older selves. If this was the Zombie Island versions, I mean, yeah, that could be fun. I particularly would have enjoyed seeing the cynical, proactive Daphne meet her more blasé older self. But by this point, they've pretty much regressed into being the same characters they used to be. Less, look how far we've come, and more, there, there are two dogs now. Couple of ascot jokes, gotta have that. And we're done. Oh my god. Putting Shaggy in his red shirt is a bit of a nice deep cut reference, but I also feel they had to do it, because otherwise they just look exactly the same. Hey, why mess with a classic look? Oh, and it's about time for that second song.
What? What? Where, where are the lyrics? They went out of money. Ah, uh, well, <clears throat> time to wrap this one up. They corner the cyber virus and manage to outsmart him. Stop explaining! Back. Job done. Really wasn't hard. The gang meet with themselves for one last goodbye before returning home. I guess this is goodbye. Bye! Oh god, fuck, I'm gonna cry. Ben is arrested for sabotaging the game out of jealousy, and the gang have lunch. That's the ending. I didn't mention before, but I loved the endings of the other three movies a lot. From the peaceful sunrise releasing the tension that hung over the bayou, to the high-energy celebratory concert in Witch's Ghost. Woo! Ben's dead! <laughs> to the surprisingly touching ending to Alien Invaders. It's not till this film that I really appreciated how they all hit different tones, but nailed their closings. This ending feels underwhelming, it's like it's going through the motions. Job done, let's have a hamburger. Which does fit the rest of the film's issues, it's a very frivolous affair. Which can be fine, but it also lacks the incredible amount of charm Alien Invaders had. My fiancé, who was surprised at how much she enjoyed the first three, had one thing to say about this one as the credits rolled against stock carnival music. Well, that was soulless. I wouldn't go that far myself. I think there is effort and care put into the film, but it's just buried deep by executive meddling and a technological shift they weren't ready for. And I think that's most clear at the very, very end. The film has this really long and odd after credit sequence, with the cast talking about their favourite parts of the movie. Just because I wear nice clothes and like to shop, doesn't mean I don't have a sense of adventure. Them all being scenes we've never seen before. Now, my initial thought was that this was just buying time and padding out the film. But then if that was the case, why stick it here after it's all over? And what's with all these shots they keep using? I think these stills are actually concept storyboards from cut scenes. They're definitely composed as such. It backs up my theory that these are scenes cut from the original draft, or even half completed before the new writer came in and changed so much. I find it very telling that these short tidbits have way more personality for the gang than any of the preceding events. You look so cute in that outfit, Freddy. Cute? That's not what I was going for. Like, they're finally allowed to stop explaining shit endlessly and be real characters. And I'm fully convinced that the original ending had Cyberscoop come out of the real world, not that underwhelming lunch scene. It's a nice thought that for how much the team was messed around and their project tampered with, they were able to squeeze in at least a little bit of what they had originally wanted at the very last second. And because of that, I find it hard to be too harsh, even though this is a bad film. I know a lot of people look back fondly on Cyber Chase, but even as a kid I knew something was off with this one. Rewatching all four films with adult eyes, it was really great being able to define the many elements of what was making them so special, and it was truly surprising to see basically none of them present in this one. But I don't want to get all angry reviewer though, it's just a bad cartoon end of the day. Scooby-Doo certainly has plenty of those. You're pushing your luck, Scoob! And if you ask the little Hasselvania Jr. if he liked Cyber Chase, he'd probably say yes. But I wonder whether he'd say that just because he liked video games, and the film had video games in it, you know? You wouldn't revisit this one during Halloween. Oh, 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 and the DVD comes with this original song. You'll find our favourite seat. Cause Scooby-Doo is that we love to eat. God, I'm so sorry, Sky Cycle. Please, please come back. Oh no, it's a morgue! All those patients that disappeared, they're dead. So, you've listened to me ruminate on this silly dog show for 58 minutes 53 seconds 11 milliseconds. But I've loved this franchise ever since I was a little shit. So, to make sure the nostalgia goggles aren't involved, I've gotten Truffs over here from Truffs Stuff, given her thoughts after having watched the trilogy for the first time ever. It's me. I really did have no frame of reference at all for the whole Scooby Doo IP until very recently, and I suspect, in the, <laughs> in the fallout from Velma, that some of you might also be in the same boat. The more I think about it, the more convinced I am that Mindy Kaling is playing 4D chess with us to get us to watch all these older adaptations. Hmm. 
Pop culture throughout the last 20 to 30 odd years might have you believing that something being Scooby-Doo is an insult, synonymous with childishness, with dreary quote-unquote mysteries for little kids born in the 1950s, and cheap animation to boot. But watching this trilogy, starting with Zombie Island, had me understanding at long last why this IP has such an appeal. It is not possible to understate just how lovable the gang is in these films. They're not just accessories to the dog, and the dog himself isn't an annoying gimmick in the slightest. Within the first few minutes of the trilogy, we see how much each member of the gang cares for one another, even though years have passed. Another strength of the gang that comes through in the trilogy is their diversity. Yes, yes, I know, I know, I see them, I know, they're all white, I see them, I know. Each one of them is a very different kind of person, is what I mean. You have your well-meaning slight himbo in Fred, your curious skeptic in Velma, your high-flying dreamer in Daphne, and your lovable goofball gluttons in Shaggy and Scooby. Even if you had them all look exactly the same, they've got clearly defined personalities that come through not because we're told that Velma's clever, or that Shaggy's a bit scattered, but because their personalities are strong enough that they all come through in the way each member of the gang responds to the same mystery unfolding in front of them. Take even one of the gang out and each film's plot would have gone quite differently. Not only do they all love each other, but they all work in tandem. And they're just cute. We've been levitated before and there's always a magnet or wire somewhere. No wires here, Fred! This just gets better and better! Maybe from where you're standing! That's enough by itself, which is partly why I think Scooby-Doo's original cheap animation didn't hinder its massive popularity. But these films are beautiful. There is no scene that comes to mind where the artists and animators phoned it in. It may not be the best animated thing ever, but it doesn't need to be. It's still visually engaging. The backgrounds are gorgeous and handcrafted, and the atmosphere palpable, especially in As well as the art, though, the plots themselves are loving tributes to the original Scooby-Doo status quo. As Hasselvania has already said, Departing from this status quo is important in creating this sense of the gang growing up in more ways than one, because so many generations of people grew up with the gang. The monsters being real is a fun adventure itself, given how atmospheric these films are, but it's like the gang has had their standard hijinks kicked up a notch now that there are bigger stakes. All in all, this trilogy of films has made me want to go back and look through the history of Scooby-Doo as a whole, because if a straight-to-VHS adaptation like this is such a cluster of bangers, maybe shows like Be Cool or Mystery Inc. also carry at least a hint of what makes this IP so well-loved. So if you've also never watched any Scooby-Doo, like I hadn't, I think these films are a great place to start. So here we are, at the end of our journey. The director dvd films would continue on, and on, and on. I know a lot of people really like Cyber Chase, the fourth of the films, but from the tone to the animation to the story, it's clearly a huge step away from this original trilogy and into the format the yearly DVD movies would adopt for the next 22 years. Ooh. Though I've only dipped into them a little bit, I've heard largely nothing but good things. In particular, I think it's really fun they made one to finally give 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo a proper conclusion the series that infamously only ever showed 12. And hell, they actually gave us more Courage the Cowardly Dog content, 21 years after that show ended. That show is such a great rewatch, by the way, it really holds up, I'll have to watch that film soon. <laughs> Cyber Chase isn't just fondly remembered, it was another big hit. In that way, it was kind of the last straw. It just didn't make sense to not be capitalising on the franchise more than yearly VHS films. The show would finally return with What's New Scooby-Doo, a true to the original series that did pretty well and teed up the first live-action movie. A, a film which, as I already mentioned, borrows heavily from these ones to, um, less of a success. I'm not sure I'd say the trilogy saved the franchise. I don't think something as big as Scooby-Doo was ever going to stay dead. It's forever burnt into the cultural zeitgeist, indicated alone by the parodies upon parodies upon parodies. 
I tell you what, I think Shaggy must be very bitter because he's obviously invested a lot of time in teaching that dog to talk and it just can't. But it was a surprise jolt to its sleeping form. It kind of made people realise what an endearing gold mine they were sitting on. And it continues to this day. For better and for worse, this goofy ass dog is going to outlive us all. And I'm okay with that. Third level, lots of luck. What? Like, what did you say, school? Go on then, <clears throat> let's do a quick ranking. Uh, one, two, three. <coughs> <coughs> Thanks so much for watching this video. I still have two massive projects in the works coming up, and this was meant to be a nice normal video to put out in the meantime, but I guess long form videos are just id by blood. With everyone rightfully dunking on Velma as well, I also felt pushed to move this video up and talk about why the series was so good and why people do get so upset when it's not treated right. Speaking of which, what is your favourite iteration of Scooby-Doo? I'd be really interested in hearing. Everyone seems to have their own specific choices, usually based on when they were born. I'm always down there in the comments annoying people, so I guess I'll see you there. Until next time, um, stay, stay spooky. Ooh.